Welcome to the President and CEO Focus on the Middle Market podcast series, where President and CEO founder Paul Stuckel discusses middle market issues with business leaders from across the nation. Today, Paul speaks with Gloria Bowen, CEO and founder of Omega Travel, about her life and learnings in growing her company from a one-location travel agency to a billion-dollar enterprise. My approach to what I do and how I tell my story is really as a goal is to help people to understand uh, what uh, is important to me as a business and why it has and how it reflects on what I think uh, is a a gift that we have in this country uh, which involves entrepreneurship and, and why I think that entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial spirit is what makes our country great and why we don't want to lose that. So it's not a political discussion, but it's uh, you know one of fact. And wherever people want to take it from a you know a political standpoint, they can do what they want with it. But it's not Republic, Democrat, liberal, or conservative. But it's just what I've learned. And um, basically, I used to be a teacher, and I had a great honeymoon and wedding reception, just kind of accidentally, on on a, on the QE2. Had a great honeymoon and all of that. Moved to Washington, where my husband was living after uh, serving in the Air Force in like the area. And uh, the whole next year, while I was teaching junior high school in Washington, I was thinking, "Oh goodness, I'd like to get back on that cruise ship for my first wedding anniversary." <laughs> so uh, now the, the thing is, is that things were different one year later than they were the year before. We had uh, gotten a minimum cabin, which was all we could afford, upper lower beds, all that. But because I was a bride and so forth, I was upgraded to, we were upgraded to a beautiful suite. The second year, weren't so lucky because I didn't have the gown. Nobody knew me. And <laughs> we were in that minimum cabin, but there were a whole bunch of travel agents on board. And they were doing, they were participating in a familiarization trip. And uh, I thought to myself, who are these people? I saved all year, you know, to go on this. Great uh, anniversary cruise, and and suddenly I'm not being upgraded. They seem to be having the best rooms and all of this. So uh, and in suites. So then, after uh, bemoaning my situation, my husband, who was getting serious about his career, which was in real estate and building, he said, "Well, Gloria, sometimes you know, if you can't beat them, you join them." And uh, that's what gave me the idea of maybe starting a little travel agency. So I uh, looked around for a job as a travel agent, didn't have any experience, and couldn't get one. There was one other small agency in the town. So I decided, well, I'm going to open one. And I learned about how to open a travel agency and what kind of money you needed, et cetera. And the fact that I also needed a um, an experienced person who could uh, help me get airlines ticket stock and get approved. I looked around and finally a 76-year-old uh, woman answered an ad. She had been a travel agent uh, in another part of Virginia. And she saw an opportunity for herself in helping me get started. So I learned a lot from her. And from another retired man who had worked up in Washington who helped me out. And they became my uh, original employees. So with one person and then the second person, I I got approved as an agency and started to realize that I also had to know the business because people always wanted to know, where's the owner? Who is this person? You know? yeah. <laughs> and I had to do marketing and advertising and things like that and get out in the community. So I knew pretty soon that I had to really know what I was doing. And so I took uh, correspondence courses given by the American Society of Travel Agents, and I was just a you know very young travel agent trying to do something with this little business. But uh, so over time, I got very ambitious, and uh, you know after I would be be visited by airline people, and um, and lo and behold, they tell me, oh, you know, there's a, an agency for sale up in further north in Woodbridge, which was a uh, a town closer to D.C. And uh, so I said that some little agency was for sale for a couple thousand dollars as long as I took their rundown desks on their humongous plants. (laughs) And uh, so I I said, oh, that would be good because it was a bigger area than Fredericksburg. So I had two offices by 1974. And I used to work 
one morning in the morning in Fredericksburg and drive up to Woodbridge a half hour later and you know spend my 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 late afternoons there and get back to Fredericksburg by eight o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night and right. and did that for uh, several years and then one night starting it was my must have been around 1977 I got home and my husband was uh, waiting for me he said he hadn't had his dinner and it was nine o'clock at night. And I said, well, I haven't had my lunch. I think we need to talk about this. <laughs> and uh, so as, as he was, his building building business was successful, but also interest rates were starting to skyrocket. Yep. Houses were not was not exactly the best place to be. And but yet my business was be, was becoming deregulated, and so there was a lot more opportunity to do creative things and travel. The airlines were kind of relaxing a lot of the rules and. Yeah, being a little more um, uh, competitive. And also, we were seeing that now you could have airline reservation systems in your office. With all of that having been said, my husband started to get more interested in what I was doing, and he had a very good eye for real estate. And I would always get questioned about whether or not I could deliver tickets to people around our great beltway in the Washington area. You know, businesses are scattered all over the place. Sure. So, uh, you know, he would run around and try to find locations for me because, you know, in those days, um, up until fairly recently, we were delivering tickets. Right. In order to deliver tickets, you had to be close to people uh, or else you were using FedEx overnight, you know, that kind of thing. As time grew, the late 70s, we were one of the first to have automation computers. And uh, we started to expand our operation by having small offices close to customers where we could get to know local people in various cities and towns and um, deliver tickets, establish relationships. So the whole marketing concept was to meet people, know them, establish relationships, have the agents who work on the accounts get to know the customer, you know, personalize service, customize approaches, Sure. No cookie cutter, no cookie cutter approach to customers, that kind of thing. But that um, entailed people. that entailed you having to go out and, and hire hire more folks. It sounds like, which is not you know not necessarily a, an easy thing to do. Yes, and and actually, I found it very important to actually work with whoever I hired for a period of time, so that they could understand what I felt was important, what my philosophy was, uh, the positive attitude doing whatever you can for the customer, uh, you know, advising the customer, finding opportunities as, as, as to how you could grow with a customer, offering them extra services up and things like that. So, you know, I'd always say that I like I like the buddy system, work next to me, let's see how we can do things together. And that generates an awful lot of camaraderie between people and loyalty. Sure. Um, and it gives people a chance to develop their own skills and to touch uh, their creativity, to tap into it. A lot of people don't didn't realize that they could do a lot of things that they learned to do here at Omega. I'm very proud of, to say that, and because um, you know the whole idea was to foster that kind of entrepreneurial spirit within the company, where you know people would feel comfortable uh, imparting to me some new ideas, um, some tips on how we could change things around to make it better for the customer and just just, just all of that. Sure. Those things that you see uh, in the front lines need to be percolated to the top over time, and I, you know that's true today. So during this time, you know, things were happening, and as you're going along, you're developing your, your plans. You know, what you think is the right way to operate it may not be the way you, you, you're going to operate 20 years later or 10 years later. So my whole philosophy is, revolves around what I call my gear shift philosophy, where I, I say, you know, it's important to know how to change routes, how to, how to, how to be flexible, how to take new opportunities, when to detour, for, detour from what you think are your only way of operating, because there isn't only one way. But there is a basic way, and in the honest way, the forthright way, the complete way. <laughs> there, there are ways, but but there's also reasons to to develop yourself. I mean, sure. companies are companies are, are kind of like you know developing your your own personality. If you're not out there looking uh, to learn more, um, 
uh, canvassing areas, you know, meeting people, learning from them, you're not going to grow a business. It's just flat out simple. Yep. And um, so education is very important, training people. But I will say that that whole idea about getting out there, moving around the greater Washington area, having multiple offices, uh, learning cultures of companies, being so what happened by the late 70s is that because of automation, because we, we had very good what we call an interface system with with our front office, like the, the reservation system, we were also able to collect data. Now, maybe that's sort of an interesting thing to be saying in today's environment. But <laughs> we were be able to we were able to collect information that was important to 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 corporations. So, hence, what developed was business travel agencies, right. where whereby you weren't just selling airline tickets, but what you're doing, you were providing information on travel spend through um, the information you were collecting on the uh, type of travel that you were putting together for employees. So companies then started to develop policies and procedures on uh, writing how on writing their travel documents or travel procedures and policy books. And so that was all very interesting. And so we, we, we developed into uh, also a business travel company agency, and where where reporting was really really key to these companies, and in the mid '80s, a lot more of uh, more of the conglomerates were formed. People were corp- corporations were expanding from their headquarters. They had you know regional offices in other parts of the country. You know, a good example would be IBM, who asked uh, me in the uh, mid '80s to open an office for them in Clear Lake, Texas. And um, and and I said, oh, that sounds interesting. So yeah, so I went ahead and did that, and it was my first office away from the Greater Washington area. We took risks. I mean, the the, uh, the federal government had always had travel handled by the airlines, and the airlines kind of treated the government traveler, you know, not in the same customized way as we would. Right. As a private company, you know, where there were long lines, a lot of people on hold, and so forth. And so what happened is in uh, 1981, the GAO had a test program, which was later administered by the GSA. But the test program was to see how well private industry could handle official government travel. And we bid on that business. And that was a kind of a big deal. It took being in Washington. So Washington was important. And it took also a, a, a great knowledge of the travel industry, which we had you know, really gotten into very hot and heavy. And, and it was risky because the airlines were not paying any commission uh, on tickets that we were selling for the government. They would, they said, we're not going to do it. But we bid on it anyway. And the first year, uh, there was a $26 million contract, which was a huge contract oh, yeah. in those days. And... Um, and with uh, and we thought, well, let's see if we can win it. And there were about five agencies that bid, but one agency was successful, and they got the whole bid. And what happened is their their year in servicing the government was brutal because they themselves had really had expertise in charter travel and for the military to Germany. And one of the reasons they won the contract was because they had very very good uh, financial statements. Because they had, uh, they had, they had, they were making a lot of money. Had, uh, they had a lot of cash and so forth. So the government awarded them the business, because in those days you had to, um, you had to use, you, you couldn't bill, you weren't billing the government, you were billing the government, but paying the airlines in cash every week for anything right. you sold. So with a twenty-six million dollar uh, contract. They were they were put they had to come up with well maybe uh, five hundred thousand every ten days or whatever you might want to say so right, you're talking right. about about they having to produce really good statements to the government to get the money because the government was paying by check so problem is is that this agency did not have a good interface accounting system fortunately we did. And that's why I mentioned the computers in the late 70s, how important that was in our growth. 
because what happened to this agency, which was very strong, they had to re-input all their data on all the tickets they were selling in order to produce a statement. (laughs) And, you know, invariably you're going to make mistakes or things are going to be somewhat not correct. And the government had the habit, has the habit, if there's one thing wrong, they don't pay. So, you know, they send the statement back. You get, you have to sending it in, and you're waiting for a $500,000 check or something like that. All of a sudden, you get the whole thing back. You have an error here. We don't understand this or that. So what happened to this agency is they eventually could not pay the airlines because they didn't have the money. And, I mean, it got so horrendous, and the government owed them so much that what they, they did is they went out to some other to some airlines directly and said, can we use your ticket stock for all of this business? And as it turned out, one uh, they, they were successful for a while, and then money would dry up. And they wouldn't be able to, I mean, they, they wouldn't be able to pay. Finally, they selected Air Florida, which in 19, uh, had a terrible accident on the 14th Street Bridge, crashed uh, back in the early 80s. And that, that was just around the time they were using Air Florida tickets to send the government to places like Africa and places that we've never heard of Air Florida to boot. Yeah, right. right. But uh, so this is a kind of a an side story I'm getting into. But what happened here is is that this agency eventually defaulted because um, a lot of the airlines would not take their ticket stock, and then they and the government owned that owed them so much money. So uh, one uh, sleepy afternoon, September 20th, or about uh, 1982, I got a call from the GSA. And they said, uh, we have an opportunity. You were one of the people bid on this piece of business. Uh, can you do a best and final offer, like a BAFO, they call it, by right. tomorrow, by tomorrow, which was Saturday, about about we need it at 9 a.m. It was 3 o'clock on Friday. I lived in Fredericksburg an hour away. We have to have it on our desk by 9 a.m. So uh, meanwhile, my husband was was not feeling well. He was home. Uh, So I'm thinking, uh, okay, I'll do this because it might be an opportunity to get some of this business. And I was really poised to get it. I could do it. I had staff. I had, you know, I I would I could even move computers because I had dial-up systems. I go back home, and he tell my husband he's excited, but he's got a headache. So I sit down at my little electric typewriter <laughs> and did my little baffo, <laughs> like a, like a, uh, a one-pager. Uh, I was exhausted, and I asked one of my, uh, a man who was a courier for me, I said, could you bring this up in the early mornings, and then I'll wait and see if they want me to come up later in the day. So he got the baffo to them. Sure enough, about four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm asked to go up to Washington. Finally, my husband was <laughs> was ready. I called a few of my trusty managers who, you know, would be excited. We walk into the GSA and they tell us that that they need us to take over about six million dollars worth of business in three government agencies by nine a.m. Monday morning, <laughs> and we have to move in computers and all this other stuff. So it was a wild. It was wild. Yeah, and fun. so that was a, but that was a, you know, all these things, the computers in 78, moving up, understanding the Washington environment. 1982 was a landmark year for us because of all the things that started to fall in place, like pieces of the puzzle started to fit. You know, we saved the government a lot of money. And my God, the things that they were doing and the service that they were getting from the airlines were was terrible. So we came in with all kinds of uh you know, good tips about getting seat assignments and answering the phone sure. on time and all that. So that was really uh, a big part of our growth. And, of course, people started to talk about us. A lot of companies started to ask us to bid on their travel. And, you know, and then, of course, in the Washington area, you've got many what they call Beltway Bandits who are around. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, you know, they, they are interested in your handling their business if, since they had contracts also with the government, so it was kind of like a natural. So at that point, so, in sort of in the mid in the mid eighties, now you're opening new offices. So how many people are you employing at that point? I I, I think at that time I probably had by that time about two hundred. By that's, the that's extraordinary. I mean, it, and, yeah. and I, I I say that simply because I mean your your background. No one no one really taught you how to do this. 
He just no. sort of did it. I mean, managing I did. managing two hundred people did. and and infusing them with your philosophy, your mission. That's that's and doing that I, basically based on tuition, intuition and and logic is really astonishing. I mean, that's a great accomplishment. I, I also give a lot of credit to my husband, who uh, while he always was a project guy, loved real estate and building and and, and loved to have have fun in life. Um, he he looked upon business and life in that way. So I I was more the serious person, but very uh, driven towards sales. But the two of us had a very were a very very uh, good combination. And mm. and we were enthusiastic about our people, our the, the ideas that we could have, um, we, just to build things. Uh, uh, enthusiastic about finding new opportunities in different cities around the country. Um, the whole thing, we really meshed. It was, and and we were together uh, through the. Uh, as soon as you know the late seventies came and the uh, I talked about inflation and so forth, we were together all the time. So by but by nineteen ninety two, we were still building, building, building uh, lots of offices. I I had so many offices in so many cities and so many places, but I connected everybody together through um, daily bulletins. We used technology to co- to communicate. So. You know, using using automation has really has been a common thread throughout my uh, my career and my growth. Um, airlines did away with commissions in '95, pretty much. They lowered them, then they went to nothing, and by '97, so you know that was a huge change. So sure. what was I going to do with all of these expensive offices and high high uh, rent areas? I had to start c- constricting all of that, going into lower. Uh, lower cost centers, finding areas of the country that would be cheaper, uh, which I did, and diminish the uh, the size of the offices. And of course, with automation also came electronic ticketing, so I didn't have that need to deliver tickets right. like I did at one time. So I had a change. Uh, by the mid '90s, uh, there was a certain amount of disillusionment as to w- whether. You know whether or not the travel industry was going to be that viable. Travel agencies, I should say, yeah, yeah. Because you had the internet coming about, uh, a lot of folks were coming up with, uh, you know, these uh, user-friendly systems where you could go on the internet and like, a, and then the Travelocity orbits all that. Expedia yeah. decided, you know, so so trends were changing, and we were kind of wondering, well, where are we headed with all of this? We knew we we knew we had to play in the online world. But we didn't want to invest money necessarily in air. And we said, well, what do we really know that might be an opportunity for us? And then we thought, well, what do we really love? And how do we get into this business and how to do the cruises? And we thought, well, no one else really has a decent cruise engine and a booking engine. On the Internet, they're all worried about air. So right. um, so that's when my husband and I looked at one another and we said, let's see if we can put a decent website up. And we were thinking, gee, let's do a search engine for cruises and a booking engine. So we kind of worked on that starting in 97. I bought the uh, URL cruise.com. And, uh, you know, the, the story has been a fantastic story for us because we were, we've been so fortunate to be able to have started that and um, have a team. We started, so we set up a separate company called TravTech and Cruise.com, but both are divisions of our mother company. And Cruise.com has become one of the largest sellers of cruises on the Internet. And that was a, a great shot in the arm for us to get into that because suddenly we were in a, we were, you know, in, the, in this online world. And at a time when the airlines were kind of coming down on us, on the travel agents, and they were not paying commissions, you know, and things were, you had yeah. to go to customers and ask them to pay a fee. When right. when when with with these commissions, we were giving money back. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. So you know, it's uh, but we've 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 uh, I've diversified the company a lot. I do a lot more meetings and incentives and uh, yeah. handle uh, do consulting. We still have uh, still work with the government. The government's you know always in some kind of turmoil and uh, <laughs> needs help. Uh, 
I, I always joke. I I didn't know. I I to this day am amazed some of the music I missed, some of the movies I didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people, you know, oh, I'd never heard of that group, uh, like Eric Clapton. Right, or, um, right. so, so I said, who who is this? Who, oh, and, and the people <laughs> in my staff look at me like their mouths hang open. I said, look, <laughs> I didn't go to the movies. I worked, but I had good time. So, but you know, that's not necessarily always the best way to live your life. I realize that. So, looking back, I would like that. And I haven't had children, and I didn't deliberately not have children. But I guess it wasn't in the cards because I was very busy. We uh, we were always had Saturday hours from day one, always right. stayed open late. But, you know, uh, then we started to be open on weekends, even on Sunday when we started to advertise in the local travel sections of the, the papers. And uh, so anyway, uh, I have a lot of, you know, fun myself. Uh, I've been through many ups and downs, as you can imagine, through the yeah. economy. Uh, you know, I've had lawsuits. I've had everything you can imagine that have happened. Sure. But uh, but but I I fortunately I grew up in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. I guess I learned a little bit about standing up for what you believe is right, and um, uh, I really get a lot of energy out of being with people and understanding them. Um, so I I am extremely grateful. I went through uh, seven years of a terrible tragedy with my husband. And, uh, you know, I, I told you he was a great guy, and we, we were, like, together all the time. And suddenly uh, he had had a couple of stents in, and one day he the doctor said he had to have an operation, bypass okay. surgery. Went in for his operation, everything, everything went wrong. Uh-huh. And uh, he uh, suffered uh, brain damage. Uh, he was in a coma. He came in and out of it, but could never, from the day he went into that hospital, could never work another day. Wow. And that was in 2004. And I did everything in my power that I could to get him better. Protocol programs, brain mapping, up to New York, specialists, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, I felt we got closer than ever. So I have a great, great love story, <laughs> but a very, uh, but also a tragic one. But yeah. I have so many things to be grateful for, and, and every day, you know, every day is something new for me. I yeah. I, I think life has been wonderful, and uh, so I tell everyone make make the most of today. I mean, do whatever you can, and yeah. don't just stay in your little environment trying to get out and be with people. Be sure to check back for future editions of the President and CEO Focus on the Middle Market podcast series. Thanks for listening.